Well, please turn with me to Psalm chapter number 16. Psalm 16, and today we are going to finish out this series that we have done this summer in the Psalms. Um, I've covered 10 of these Psalms this summer. This will be the 10th one, and you covered another three while I was gone when uh, Kirk and Travis and Gavin preached from different Psalms. And each one of these psalms this summer has, in some way, I feel like, um, spoken uh, directly to us in a way that we needed to hear from God this summer. In various ways that each of us in our own lives have encountered difficulties and frustrations and fears, and they have been uh, very timely and you couldn't have picked better psalms if we would have gone through all 150 and tried to pick out the best uh, 12 or 13 psalms for the summer. We, we couldn't have picked better ones than these. I don't know, though, in this past week that I have felt more um, convicted about the psalm that I'm preaching on a Sunday than I have this one. And what I mean when I say convicted is not convicted in the sense of being convicted by this psalm of sin or something like that, but convicted of the need overall that God's people have to hear from God in this particular psalm. The reason I say that is because Psalm 16 is a psalm of confidence. I've been a pastor for over 20 years, and I don't know that I have ever felt as concerned for the lack of confidence amongst God's people as I have in the past year and a half. And it's to our shame, it's to our shame as the people of God that we would ever allow anything any moment in the history of our lives to rattle our confidence. Our whole faith is built on the truth that our God is sovereign, that he is powerful, that there's nothing, nothing in this world that will ever unseat him from his position as the ruler of his universe. And I look this year at this world and I see irrational, illogical fear. And it concerns me for people in general, but most of all for the people of God. There should never be a moment in which the people of God live with an irrational fear of death because we know that Christ has overcome death. And this week as I've studied this psalm and as I've sat with it, I have thought over and over again about the demonic nature of fear, the satanic origin of fear, because that's where it comes from. You see, fear comes from the idea that God can't be trusted. That's what we see in the very first moment that humanity sins and the world is plunged into sin is that Satan comes and he calls the people of God, Adam and Eve, to doubt what God has said. And when they doubt what God has said, everything spirals under control. Are out of control. And I believe that Psalm 16 is, is in some way put right here in our Bibles to, to act for us as, as an authoritative word, just like when Jesus spoke to people who were possessed by a demon and cast the demon out of them. I think Psalm 16 needs to cast the fear out of the church. It needs to cast the fear out of the people of God. 
It is irrational. It is absolutely irrational to live in the way that we have lived in this past year and a half. In April, I was hiking in the mountains. I was 5,000 feet up a mountain, far removed from anything but bears and trees. And on the other side of the river, far away from every, did, not on the path with the rest of the hikers, but on the other side of the river, all alone, 5,000 feet up a mountain is a man hiking in a mask. As if the trees or the wind would infect him. Monday I went for a run and I saw a man all alone riding a bicycle in a mask. I see people in cars alone. You can't give COVID to your car. Now, this would be funny if it weren't so terrifying to think that we have arrived at a place of being so afraid that we look at other human beings and we no longer see them as people placed in the world by God for either fellowship as believers or to be converted by us as Christians. And yet we just see them as some kind of threat to us. And we have to escape them. And that's on one side. But just so you don't think I'm on the path of just going after those people. It's also irrational for people in the church to run around assuming that things like the vaccine is the mark of the beast. This is equally crazy, as if the book of Revelation even knew who Moderna was. The problem is, is that as the people of God, we have just become afraid and we cannot hope in any way whatsoever to be the strong, faithful witness to the gospel, which tells us that our thing, our thing as the people of God, is that we're not afraid of death. That's no one else's thing. It's our thing. Our thing isn't reincarnation so that we're afraid of dying to come back as a cricket? Our thing is that we're not afraid of death. And you know why you and I are sitting here? Because Christians in the first century who were not afraid of death were willing to be marched into the Colosseum with their three and four year olds in tow and be fed to the lions if it meant standing faithful as witnesses to Christ. Now, I don't think we'd stand in the Colosseum and face lions, because we can't even stand in our neighbor's kitchens anymore because we're so afraid of death. We can't even come to church anymore because we're so afraid of death. Church, we can't come to church when they went to the Colosseum to face the lions because we're afraid of death. Yes, I'm going after it this morning. And I want to put a dagger in its heart. And then I want to stand over it with Psalm 16 and say, Jesus says you can't get up. We're the people of God. Do you understand? You are possessed by God. You're his possession. Unless you're willing to confess that he has lost hold of his possession, 
then you are not permitted by your king to waver from his mission in fear of an enemy he has already conquered. How about I pray? Father, I pray you would strengthen us this morning as your people. May this final psalm this summer empower us to live as faithful witnesses in this world. And if we die at the cost of being faithful to you, then let us remember that our blood was it shed on the Colosseum floor or was it simply dried up and we died as a result of old age, Lord? Whatever the cost, however our end comes, let us meet our end with our heads held high, knowing we were faithful to our King Jesus. Speak to us now in your word as we need to hear from you. In Christ's name, amen. Let me read Psalm 16 for you. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is God's word. This psalm begins, let me just answer the obvious question, which is what is a mitcom of David? I don't know. No one really does. It occurs six times in the Psalms. There are six of these. And each time it celebrates, it's a psalm that celebrates the salvation of the righteous. But other than that, there's really no certainty about what it actually means. But I want you to notice the way this psalm begins. It says, keep me safe, my God. Notice that simple petition. Keep me safe. Now, Unlike other psalms that begin with a certain circumstance in which we look at it and say, this is the threat that David is facing. This psalm doesn't present any certain threat. And so we look at it and we say, well, since it doesn't present a certain threat, it's just a general psalm of confidence that David has for all of life. Lord, in all of life, keep me safe. Now, I want you to think about that concept of all of life. You and I typically, most people typically, call upon the Lord when we sense danger in some way. There's some sort of danger to us, and maybe it's a, a physical threat or an illness or maybe some sort of emotional or spiritual threat that we're concerned about. And so because we sense that, we call upon God. God, please come and help me and rescue me. But the truth of the matter is, is that we really should be looking to the Lord in all of life, not just when we sense danger. Now, the reason we shouldn't do it just when we sense danger is because the truth is, and this is probably not good news for some of you who are warriors, is that we're always in danger. You know, we're always in danger in the sense that we have a, an evil enemy who's opposed to us. Satan is always 
after us. In fact, 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So here's what you need to know. Satan wants to kill you. He wants to kill you every moment of your life because he hates you. And he hates you because you've been created in the image of God. When Satan looks at you, he is reminded of God and he hates God. And so he hates you and he wants to devour you. And so the truth is, is that most people think of fear when they sense danger. But if they really understood that they had an enemy in Satan who wanted to devour them. And if they really understood that they were every day faced with all sorts of threats in this world they probably would freak out and never get out of bed in the morning. In fact, could you imagine, for some of you in this room, what it would be like if you got the presidential briefing from the CIA this morning? I mean, you'd probably never fly, probably wouldn't drive your car. Or could you I have a, a son in medical school, and he's told me, like, Dad, if you just saw all the bacteria that I've just learned about, you'd never leave the house, all right? There's just stuff out there, right? We're just subject at any moment to something. So we need God's presence to keep us safe every moment of our life, not just in the moments that we sense the danger. Now notice, the look at this prayer. Look at what he says. He says, Lord, keep me safe. Now that's an interesting word. It's the Hebrew word shamar, and it's translated here in the NIV as keep. And it's a good translation because what that word means is to keep watch over in the sense of guarding someone, looking after them. Listen to how the word is used in God's promise to Jacob in Genesis 28, verse 15. I am with you and will watch over you. He's looking upon you. See, that's why this is a good translation here because he's watching you. He's guarding you wherever you go. Just like a helicopter parent, God is right there. Wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Listen to how this is used in Psalm 121. What a remarkable psalm, one that you probably should stick with a lot during these days. Verse 1, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Well, that's a good place for help to come from. Not from some place that is uh, uncertain to provide in the moment of need, but from God. He's created heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who, here it is, watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you. There's the same word, from all harm. He will, here it goes, same word, watch over your life. Verse 8, the Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Pause just for a moment here. Let all those words just sink in. Just let them sink in. The Lord watches over you. Let those words sink in. The Lord, the Lord watches over you. The Lord watches over you. The Lord will keep you from harm. He will watch over your life. Oh, how can we live with fear when we've read those words? The only way is if we join the side of the enemy who doubts all of God's words and causes us to doubt them, or we stand on the side of Jesus and we say, no. This is what he says. He says he will watch over my life. You see, the only way you will ever be free from fear, free to worship, free to serve the Lord with joy and with courage, free to serve Christ, even if it means your own martyrdom and death, is to believe God. It's to trust Him because His Word tells us right here, He will watch over your life. 
You see, here's what's remarkable about Psalm 16. It's not that it promises us that we'll never die, but Psalm 16 promises us that God will keep us safe even in death. So even when we do die, God will keep us safe. That's why Psalm 16 is remarkable. Psalm 16 doesn't blow smoke at you and say, oh, don't worry about death, you're never going to die. No, instead, Psalm 16 goes right to the heart of the matter and says, hey, guess what? You're going to die. Yep, you're going to die. And you say, oh, I don't like that. He says, don't worry about it. How am I going to die? It doesn't matter. Well, what if, can, can I die when I'm old? Maybe. But can I die when I'm, is it going to be tragic? Is it going to be a plane crash? Maybe. Is it, is it going to be COVID? Maybe. Well, then how is this supposed to be helpful? Because in all those circumstances, when you die, however you die, God's going to keep you safe. He's going to watch over you. You say, safe? Safe seems to mean I won't die. No, you're going to die. You ever met a thousand-year-old? Nope. Well, guess what? You're going to die. Look here. Verse 1, David makes this petition to God. Notice that very generic phrase, keep me safe, God. This is a Lord. He says, God. Guess what that word God is? This is a Hebrew word, El, which is the most generic uh, term for God. It, it stresses the transcendence and power of God meaning that God is the giver of life. So that means that he's the one who is sovereign over life and death because life comes from him. Notice here, David now then says in verse 2 that he has to confess his complete dependence upon God. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Notice the two occurrences of the word Lord. The first time it's in all caps. I've told you a lot of times that means Yahweh. That's the covenant name. And then the second one is in lowercase, Lord. This is the word Adonai, which means master. So David is saying to Yahweh, you are my master, which means that David is his slave. It means that he's owned by God. Everything he has is from God. And it means that David must be loyal to him. Therefore, everything that David has must come from him. And that's why he says, apart from you, I have no good thing. Now, the ESV says, apart from you, I have, I have no good apart from you. And that's a little misleading because it might make us think after reading Psalm 14 and 15 that when he says, I have no good apart from you, that he's referring to moral goodness or righteousness. But that's not what it means in this context. What he's saying here is, is I don't have anything from you. I have nothing. Everything that I possess in this world, all the good things I have, they come from you. Notice in verse 1 and verse 2 then, that there's a connection here between trust and obedience and loyalty and dependence. See, it's not enough to say, I trust God, because we have to obey him. This is why David says, keep me safe. I trust you. You are my master, which means I can't just say I trust you. It means I also have to obey you, which means that we have to live in total dependence upon him as we obey him. Now in verse 3, we see that David's loyalty to God gets demonstrated in his loyalty to God's people. Look at verse 3. He says, I say of the holy people who are in the land, they, the holy people, they're the noble ones, and all my delight is in them. That phrase, holy people, isn't referring to Israel as a nation collectively, but rather those people within the nation of Israel who have separated themselves in how? In trust and obedience and loyalty and dependence upon God in such a way that they've set themselves apart for the Lord. They say, we're going to set ourselves apart for the Lord in a significant way. And David says, these holy people, they are the noble ones. And that word noble can mean majestic. They're majestic. They're, they're, they're splendous when I look at them. There's something magnificent about them. 
I think the New Living Translation captures this really well. It says, the godly people in the land are my true heroes. What a great statement. The godly people, they're my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. That's why if you come to my office, you don't see pictures of, you know, Michael Jordan. You see statues of Charles Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, Martin Luther, and John Calvin, men who were godly and stood for something. I want to be reminded that there were people that went before me and did what I do, and they were faithful, and we're to be like them. They're the heroes. You see, God's people, we should honor and esteem those who are faithful to the Lord, because when we do, we demonstrate our own loyalty to God. Remember what we saw in Psalm 15? Listen to Psalm 15, verse 4. The one who despises a vile person but honors those who fears the Lord is the one who's welcomed into the presence of God. You see, David says all his delight is found in those who fear the Lord. They're majestic to him. So, you know, you have to ask, who are your heroes? Who do you delight in? Who are your kids' heroes? Who have you taught them to delight in? in. See, we need to teach our kids that God's people, the ones who are holy, the ones who are loyal and obedient and trust God in total dependence, those people, they're majestic. They're true heroes. If your kids know the names of celebrities and athletes and they idolize them and they don't know the names of the faithful people of God, then you're not demonstrating that you esteem the holy ones who are noble, but rather you've honored in your home the vile ones. And sadly, this is what we often do. We honor the vile ones. And we shouldn't honor them. We should despise their way of life because their way of life cares nothing about the Lord, and therefore it's going to lead to destruction. Why should our kids follow in their path and be led to destruction? Why should we follow in their path and be led to destruction? Look at verse 8. Verse 4, I'm sorry. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will pour out libations of blood. I will not pour out libations of blood to such a God or take up their names on my lips. See, notice David trusts the Lord to keep him safe. But those who are running after other gods, chasing after other things, looking to something else or someone else to keep them safe, David says, no, 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 no. Uh, that, that's not going to be good. Those people aren't going to find safety. Instead, here's what they're going to find. They're going to find more and more suffering. And that phrase suffering there is an interesting word. It refers to a painful wound. They're going to be hurt. They're going to go after these other gods thinking it's going to provide safety. This is going to hurt them. And oh, how have we seen this? We've seen so often the people of God find themselves in moments of desperation where we say later, why did you do that? What were you thinking? And here's what they say. Oh, I was afraid. I didn't know what to do, so I just did it. And now look, what, look at the hurt it's caused. Why? Because look, I was afraid. I didn't know what to do. No, we know what to do. The Psalms have told us over and over again. We run to the Lord. The Lord is our refuge. The Lord is our strength. The Lord, He is the one who watches over us. Understand God in this moment is watching over your life. He's watching over every aspect of your coming and going. Wherever you are, wherever you go, God sees all of it. He doesn't stumble when you stumble in the dark. There's no darkness to him. He is the light. And so why would we ever find ourselves uttering words like, well, I was afraid, I didn't know what to do, and that's why I'm in this predicament. We always know what to do. There are no predicaments for the people of God. There is only the God who rules the predicaments. That's what we have to remember. David says, I'm not going to take part in their pagan worship. I'm not doing that. That's what pouring out libations of blood. It means offering sacrifice to these gods. He's not going to do that. He's not even going to take their names on his lips. I'm not even going to say that. Because these lips were meant to honor God. I'm going to take God's name in my mouth. Why would I, moments before singing his praise... Put that filthy name of that other God in my mouth. I'm not doing that. We shouldn't do that either. Verse 5, Lord, you alone 
are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines, they've all fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. See, these verses contain imagery that's so rich because it refers to Israel's inheritance of the promised land. When Israel went into the land, these very words were used. Notice these words, portion, lot, lines, inheritance. Remember what happened when Israel, after being rescued out of Egypt, was brought to the promised land after wandering in the desert for 40 years? They came to the land, and it was time to go into the land. And what did God say to them before they went into the land? He says he's going to give them the land. He says specifically he's going to give every tribe a portion of the land. And he said, here's how you're going to decide who gets what portion of the land. You're going to cast lots. And the reason they cast lots is because they understood that God was sovereign over the lots. Even when the lots were cast, God was sovereign over them. Nothing was random in this world that God created. Nothing is random in the world God created. Nothing has happened to you by accident or by chance. God is sovereign. And that's why you can have confidence when he watches over your life. Because nothing's going to happen to you by chance. God will use everything in your life for his purposes to sanctify you and make you like Christ and bring you into his kingdom safe, even if you die in the Colosseum floor. See, this is who God is. He's the one who determines how the lines fall. Because when the lots were cast, that meant that the boundary lines, the portion of land they got, would fall in this area for one and in that area for another, and that would be their inheritance. The only tribe, though, that didn't receive an inheritance, a portion of the land was who? It was the Levites. Why? Because the Levites were the priests. And what did God tell the Levites? You don't get a portion in the land. No inheritance for you. Why? Because I'm going to be your portion. You're going to inherit me. They got the Lord. And now notice David sees himself in that sort of way. Look at what Numbers 18.20 says. The Lord said to Aaron, that was the, the, the patriarch of the Levitical priests, you will have no inheritance in their land, nor will you have any share among them. I am your share in your inheritance among the Israelites. Deuteronomy 18.2. They, that would be the Levites, shall have no inheritance among their fellow Israelites. The Lord is their inheritance, as he promised them. See, he always fulfills his promises. So this means that the Levites are to be a tribe set apart for the Lord. They're to belong to him. Within the holy nation of Israel, they're the holy people. That means they have to live in trust and obedience and loyalty and complete dependence upon God because they won't have anything if God doesn't give it to them. They don't have land to work. So they can't, they, they can't go out and, and harvest crops to feed themselves. They have to depend upon the other people, which means ultimately they have to depend upon God. That's what you and I have to do every day. We all have to depend upon God. Don't think, well I, well, I own my own business. Your business will collapse tomorrow if God wants it to. You see, you have to depend upon God. We all depend upon God. Notice here, David says, I'm like the Levites. The Lord is my portion. He is my inheritance. And he says, the Lord is his cup, which means God is his blessing. Now, we need to remember two things here that I think are really important. First of all, we got to remember that each one of these tribes received a portion of the land, and it was determined by the Lord. The Lord determined how much land they got and how much land they didn't get, implying that God oversaw everything in their life. So David is simply acknowledging here that God is sovereign over life and that everything that he has, it all comes from the Lord. And so God controls his life, and he controls his future destiny. But here's what else we need to remember. This is really important too. You know what else we have to remember is this. We have to remember David was the king. And you know why that's significant? That means there was no one else in that entire kingdom who was as wealthy as David. So David is the king, the richest man, and yet notice he doesn't put any of his trust in his power as king or his possessions from being king. None of that is any uh, sense of provides any sense of comfort for David. Only God does. He says, I have everything, but I trust in the Lord. David knows everything he has comes from the Lord. And that's why he says in verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I don't have any good thing. So he rejoices, not so much in the good things he possesses, 
but in the Lord who possesses his life. It's very similar to Psalm 73. Listen to verse 25 to 26. This is a psalm of Asaph, and it says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart, they may fail, and they will, folks. One day, your flesh is your body. One day, your body's going to give out. One day, your heart is going to fail. It's going to stop beating. I don't know how many beats your heart has. Every one of us in this room, we have an individual number of beats that our heart will beat. And then it's going to end. Your body's going to fail. And <laughs> I've done so many funerals as a pastor. And every time their family looks at me and they just say, Pastor, we just thought we'd have more time. I've heard this presiding over the funeral of a 20-year-old, and I've heard it presiding over the funeral of an 80-year-old. See, it's never enough. But David says, listen, I trust the Lord. Asaph says, my heart and my flesh may fail, but God He is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Your heart won't beat forever. God will be your portion forever. So you look to the Lord and you trust him and you love him. Verse 7 says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. Remember what Psalm 1 said? David said in Psalm 1, Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Now look at what he says in Psalm 16, verse 4 again. Those who run after other gods, that would be those who walk in the path that sinners take, they're going to suffer more and more. What does Psalm 1 say? That path's coming to an end. But he says, I'm not even going to pour out libations. I'm not going to partake in this. I'm not even going to take their names on my lips. David says, I have no regard for the wicked, for the sinners, for the mockers, for those who run after other gods. No. David says, I praise the Lord who counsels me. And how does the Lord counsel him? He counsels him through his law, through his instruction, through his word. What is David delighting in? He's delighting in that law, and he meditates on it. And therefore, look, even at night, he says his heart is instructing. The the inner being of David, his conscience, is instructing him at night. Why? Because David has meditated on God's law day and night. And so when he lays down on his bed at night, what's running through his mind? Not the crazy stuff of the day, but the law of the Lord, the promises of God. Oh, here's why you can't sleep at night, folks. You can't sleep at night when the thoughts of the day run through your mind. I understand it. It happens to me. I mean, you just lay down and you just have things going through your mind. You replay conversations. You replay this. You think of this. Well, what if this and what if that? And next thing you know, you're not asleep. But you know when I do sleep is when I lay down and I say to myself, the Lord watches over my life. The Lord watches over my life. Verse 8, we see this sort of faith and trust that this result is saturating in oneself and in God's word and it, and it brings about this faith and trust. He says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And what an amazing line. With him And my right hand is right there next to me. You know what it means to have something in your right hand? Well, I can tell you this. Right here, this isn't my right hand because I can reach it. I can't reach it over here. It's not in my right hand. God is within reach. I can reach it. I can reach him. With God at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Listen very carefully. This verse, verse 8, is incompatible with the way that Christians have lived in the past year. It's incompatible. Look at that verse. We cannot say, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And then spend every waking moment of our life shaken by irrational fears. We can't do it. You see, listen. Let's reverse that verse. When you keep your eyes always on social media, with your 
panicked friend at your right hand, you will always be shaken. When you keep your eyes on the news with that crazy news host always at your right hand, you will always be shaken. And let me desecrate what is sacred. When you keep your eyes always on the daily case number with Dr. Fauci at your right hand, you will always be shaken. I could substitute any wonder, uh, number of names. It doesn't matter. I'm just telling you the one that's the most prominent. When your focus is on these things, you're going to be shaken, guys. You're going to be shaken. When you keep your eyes always on the worst case scenario with you at your right hand. You will always be shaken, always. But when you keep your eyes always on the Lord with him at your right hand, you will never be shaken. David says this while staring in the eyes his own death. Look at what he says. He's confident that even in death, he's not going to lose his joy. He says in verse 9, Therefore my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure. Now this isn't superficial happiness or denial in the face of death. This is deep inner joy. See, this heart here is a reference to his inner being. Literally, it's kidneys. In the phrase, my tongue rejoices. So your translation may say something different, your body rejoices or whatever, but this, this is a translation of, of the, uh, the, the Hebrew says, my glory rejoices. So go figure that one out. But the, the, the Septuagint translates this as, my tongue rejoices. And that's what Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. In other words, here's what David's saying. He's saying, I'm rejoicing on the inside and on the outside. Now think about this. We are very accustomed to seeing people who appear to be really glad or happy on the outside. And they, they portray on the outside that they're happy and that they're glad and nothing really gets them down and they're kind of the life of the party. But really, the truth is, on the inside, they're never really happy. They don't really experience any deep joy. On the outside, they're happy, but on the inside, they are riddled with fear and sorrow. And then we also know another kind of person, the kind of person who is in some way uh, claiming that they have joy on the inside, while outwardly portraying the fact that they're not really happy about anything. And so you meet them, and you're like, wow, they're just so down. And it's like, no, I have inner joy. Wow. Remind me not to get that version. <laughs> Listen to these words again. What's the key to having inner joy and outer joy? An inner joy that, that manifests itself in the emotions of being a joyful person. So you're like, I like being around that person. Why? Man, when I'm around them, they just make me feel, I feel more joyful. What makes that happen? Well, here's what, here's the words. Listen to verse eight. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Well, then I want to be next to you. Because if you're not shaken, maybe when I'm with you, I won't be shaken. Therefore, because your eyes are always on the Lord and you're never shaking. Therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. See, there's the key to deep inner joy and manifesting itself in our outer emotions. It's right there, keeping your eyes always on the Lord. It is to be clear, David's not a stoic. David is not saying, you know, I just simply accept whatever comes to pass. I don't respond to it, completely disconnected from my emotions. It's not what he says. No, David is a man of deep faith, and this deep faith allows him, therefore, to say that I trust in the Lord whatever comes to pass. 
whatever comes to pass. I'm not indifferent to it. I trust in the midst of it. That's a big difference. Here's what makes all this so powerful. As I told you already, David's not just talking about some minor detail he's facing. Oh, Lord, there's a dangerous moment here approaching. Get me out of this. Nope. Lord, there's a finality to the moment that is approaching. And I know that I'm not going to be delivered out of it. But you're going to keep me safe in it. That's what makes this so profound. Because look at what he says in regard to his own death. My body also will rest secure. What an amazing thing to think that as a Christian, when we lay your body in the ground, your body will be kept secure until the day that Christ appears and you are resurrected into glory. David is secure, he is confident, not only in his life, but also in his death. Not even the prospect of his own death can shake him. It doesn't rattle him. It doesn't cause him to lose joy. He's not hiking on the other side of the river alone with the mask. He's running into the face of the giant with a sling and a rock. This is David's confidence. Both his inner joy and his outer joy, they're all grounded in knowing this one thing, that even his physical body is secure in death because he's trusted God in his life. That means that he can trust God in his destiny after death because God is sovereign over both. Why? Because remember, God determined, look, his portion, his inheritance, that means that David has trusted him in his life for everything that's come to him, but now he can trust him in his death. God is both sovereign over his life and he's sovereign over his death. God is sovereign over your life. God is sovereign over your death. We have to remember that, folks. You're not going to die one second earlier than God intends for you to. You are not going to die one second later than God intends for you to. If God intends for you to die, there is no cure, no antibiotic, no treatment, no vaccine, no life support system that can keep you alive. And if God intends for you to live, there is no terrorist or virus on earth that can take you out. Your life belongs to God. And if God is sovereign over our death, then he is also sovereign over the lives that we live, which means that when we face our deaths and oftentimes say, I'm ready to die, I'm just worried about my kids I'm going to leave behind, we must in that moment say, the same God who is sovereign over my death will be sovereign over the rest of their lives. God is sovereign. And so he says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. Here's why he's so confident that his body will rest secure. Look at verse 10. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. What a great phrase. You will not abandon me. It's not going to happen. God's not going to leave you in the grave. He's not going to leave you on the doorstep of death. He says, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Even when David dies. And I know some translations say the Holy One. And I think faithful is, uh, is what we need to say here because it's the, the, the emphasis upon the, the concept of the Holy One is the one who has been loyal to God, the one who's been faithful to God. The King James translated this for, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. And the ESV says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. But the word soul here isn't referring to the disembodied. Spirit, soul in the, in the Psalms is a poetic way of, of being used as a, of a, as a personal pronoun in the first person. You will not let me. You're not going to let me. Just the same as when we say that uh, the, the ship sunk and there were 3,000 souls lost at sea. We don't mean that out on the ocean are 3,000 souls flying around. We mean that there were lives lost. And the word sheol here is not a reference to hell, but it's a reference to 
the realm of the dead, the place just under the surface of the earth in the Hebrew thought. David's simply saying this, God, I'm approaching death. You're not going to leave me in the grave. You're not going to leave me there. I'm going to be okay. God, I've been loyal to you, and I know you will be loyal to me. You're not going to let your faithful servant rot in the grave forever. Verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. Both this psalm and David's life together, they're all summarized in this final line of this psalm, aren't they? David trusts God in life. Why? Because God is with him. And because God is with him, he makes known to him the path of life. David, this is the way to go. Okay, Lord. Wait a minute, Lord. You said this is the way to go, but right up ahead here, there's pain. God, right up ahead here is, there's, there's death. Lord, this is the path of life, but there's death in the path. But Lord, you are my master. If you've led me on this path, and surely you intend to deliver me on this path, you will keep me safe. See, David trusts God in his death because God is with him. And even in his death, God will fill him with joy in his presence with eternal pleasures at God's right hand. You see, in his life, David has kept God at his right hand. Remember that in verse 8? Look at verse 8. You're at my right hand. With you at my right hand, I won't be shaken. So his whole life, David's kept God at his right hand. And what does God say to him? And now, David, when you die, I'll keep you at my right hand. See, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to leave you there. I'm not going to leave you in the grave. What are you going to do, God? David, I'm going to fill you with joy. Have you ever imagined for a few moments, just let let your mind run to the place of of answering the question that you ask? What's it going to be like the moment I die? I don't don't know what, what to expect. Oh, here, here it is, guys. The moment you die, you're going to be filled with joy. You're going to be filled with joy. Talk about taking the sting out of death. You're going to be filled with What kind of joy? Well, I'll tell you this. Better than any joy you've ever experienced in your entire life. In fact, if we took the multitude of all the joy you've ever experienced in your entire life, put it together, times did a billion it would seem as nothing. Last breath, last beat of the heart, brain goes still, instant joy. Last breath, last beat of the heart, brain goes still, filled with eternal pleasure. Now that kind of takes the fun out of death's little pity party that it wants to throw for you. Because you know what we say then? We say, well, wow, I guess they didn't lose their life to cancer. I guess cancer lost its battle for their life because their life had been claimed by God. God held their life when cancer lost it. See, I told us, I I said at the beginning that fear of death, when you really just step back, put it in front of Psalm 16 and say, God, let your word assess this irrational fear I have. And God says, well, to live with irrational fear of death, well, that would be, be kind of a demonic way to live. They say, why? Well, because that would come from Satan. Why would it come from Satan? Well, because Satan, from the beginning, has done one thing. He's tried to get you to doubt my word. This is what he did with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve said, oh, no, 
I, we're not supposed to do, God said don't do this. So, uh, don't, don't worry about what he said. That's what Satan wants you to do when you fear death. You say, wait a minute, God, but God's word said, I, with you at my right hand, I won't be shaken. No, he didn't really mean that. And besides that, you've been a horrible Christian, and so you should be shaken. You ought to be afraid. You should be scared. Well, but I think Jesus said it's finished. Don't worry about what he said. He was talking about someone else. Not you, not you. Your sins are too bad. Nope. You, ought to, you should be afraid. You should shake. That doesn't sound like God. Think about how amazing it is to believe that Adam and Eve, after they had been deceived, after they'd bought into this lie, it sounds much like that poem Invictus. It says very clearly, you are the master of your own fate, the captain of your soul. Which everyone likes to quote that heretical poem. Adam and Eve discovered really quickly, oh no, we've been deceived and now we're going to die. And because we're going to die, we can't stop it from happening. Our only hope now is to put our trust in the one that we just betrayed. And the one they just betrayed says, well, I tell you what, I'll send my son to earth and I'll allow him to be betrayed in order that you might not be betrayed by me in death. What an amazing thing. An unbelievable thought to consider that God was willing to step right into the place of our worst error, our worst mistake, our worst transgression, and allow that same transgression to be committed against him in order that we might never have to fear death. I said Psalm 16 is meant to drive the fear out of the church. That Psalm 16 is meant to stab a dagger into the fear of death and then stand over it as one who has conquered it and dare it to get up. And I hope that you'll come back to this psalm a lot during your life. You're going to need it now. You're going to need it tomorrow. I promise you you're going to need it in the years to come. There's going to be so many things happen in your life that you never could have dreamed would happen to you. And those things are going to cause you to question God's faithfulness. Cause you to question if you can really trust his word. And you're going to need Psalm 16. You're going to need it as a close friend. This psalm is obviously very important. Because Peter quotes this psalm in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. We'll look at that in a couple of weeks. Paul quotes it in his sermon at Pisidian Antioch in Acts chapter 13. We'll look at that in a few years. <laughs> but here's the thing, guys. You know why both Peter and Paul quoted this? Because they had a tremendous understanding. What they understood when they looked at this psalm is that the death and resurrection of Jesus were the very thing that they must look to to understand that death had been conquered forever. Death had been forever conquered and that in trusting our lives to God when we face death is the most basic thing that a Christian can do. The most basic thing that we as Christians can do is just say with confidence, right here, verse 10, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. That's what we can say. And we can say with confidence because God loves us and Christ died for us. When Christ died for us, he took our sin upon himself and was judged in our place. And then he died because the wages of sin, what we deserved, were death. And then he was raised from the dead 
conquering death, which means now when we face death, we don't have to fear the judgment of God if we're in Christ. That means we've repented of our sins, we've turned from ourselves, we've turned to Christ. We don't have to fear the judgment of God in death because Christ has been judged for us. We don't have to fear our bodies rotting in the grave forever because Christ has conquered death, which means that there is nothing for us to fear in death. So now that we no longer have to fear death, it would be appropriate to simply say what Romans 8 says. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. That means God's the one who's declared you righteous. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who's praying for you this morning? Jesus. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution? How about famine or nakedness or danger? What about a sword? Well, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. In fact, we're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. We didn't just conquer this. We stood over it and dared it to stand up. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let us then say with confidence, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Father, Thank you for your word steering us into the calm waters of truth. We sing your praise. The one true King Jesus who forever reigns. Amen.